Hello everyone and welcome to today's Southern Cross University online webinar, The Future of Health Leadership and Management. My name is Amelia and I'll be your moderator for today and we're delighted to have so many of you join us and take 45 minutes out of your day to learn a little bit from our resident expert Dr. Louise Horsmanshoff. Um, before we get started, I do have a little bit of housekeeping just about how to use GoToWebinar. So as you will have worked out, all attendees are in listen-only mode, so everyone's on mute. That means that the best way to ask us a question, and we would love to hear your questions, is to use the question tab on the GoToWebinar control panel, which is typically located on the right-hand side of your screen. Throughout the presentation, if you type your question in there, we'll come to those at the end. If we don't get to your question, we will contact you afterwards to follow up. Um, also wanted to let you know that the session is recorded, so if you've got a friend or a colleague that really wanted to be here today but couldn't make it, please feel free to share the recording with them. Similarly, if you're at work and you get interrupted or something like that, you will get the recording tomorrow. Um, we do also do a survey at the end and we'd love to hear your feedback. So the survey will pop up automatically and looking forward to hearing everybody's feedback about the session. Okay. So today in the next 45 minutes we're going to learn about the future of health leadership and management from Dr. Louise Horsmanshoff. She's our resident expert from Southern Cross University and works with us on the Southern Cross University online Master of Healthcare Leadership. We'll also at the end come through and look a little bit at some of the healthcare degrees that we offer. So a number of people on the line have already started studying with us. A lot of people are thinking about studying or previously inquired about one of our online degrees. And a number of you might be new to Southern Cross University but thinking about postgraduate study in the near or distant future. So we will cover a little bit about how you can continue to study with us. And then as I said, we'll come through to the question and answer at the so before we jump into that, I would love to learn a little bit more about the audience that we have today. So I've got two quick polls for you. Um, the polls will pop up automatically. So the first thing that we're going to see is what your profession is. So get in quick and let me know what your current profession is. Love to hear what you're doing, what you're qualified as. Bit of a mix in there. Just a couple more seconds to pop in your answer and we might just close it off there. Great. So, this is what we've got dialing in today. So we had 58% of you uh, working in nursing or midwifery, 17% in allied health, 12% health administration and management, 7% education and 7% other. So a bit of a mix bit of an emphasis on nursing and midwifery there, which is great. One of the largest professions in Australia, so great to see that. Now the next question, just a bit of a get to know you. Um, just go live with that one. So where are you based? So again, quickly pop your answer in. Bit of a distribution. Some people are still in their morning, some are in the afternoon like New South Wales and Victoria. Just a couple more seconds and we'll just close that off there. So here we go. 38% of you are based in Queensland. So um, sunny Queensland up there north till the morning. Um, New South Wales and Victoria, about half of us are based in uh, New South Wales, ACT, Vic and Taz and then South Australia, WA, Northern Territory and no one from overseas today. So that's great. Thanks so much for sharing. Okay. So a little bit about us then. So Southern Cross University had its beginnings in the 1970s as a teacher's college and was established as a university in 1994. We have campuses at the Gold Coast, Lismore, Coffs Harbour, hotel schools and branch campuses in Sydney and Melbourne. And we obviously run Southern Cross University online which has students from across Australia and more than 60 countries around the world. We were, the, were one of the pioneers in online learning and over the past 23 years we've developed online learning um, and have had more than 5,000 students each year enrol in our online courses. 
Southern Cross University Online and the degrees that we'll be talking about later on today was established specifically to cater for working professionals and enable people to go and get that master's degree that they've always wanted while working full time. So I'll share a little bit more about that today. Now I'm going to introduce our esteemed uh, expert, my colleague Dr Louise Horsmanshoff. Louise is the postgraduate framework lead in the School of Health and Human Sciences. Is also the course coordinator for the Master of Healthcare Leadership and has a wealth of experience in leadership and healthcare and she'll be sharing some of her insights and um, some of the trends and knowledge and research in healthcare leadership with us today. So welcome Louise, thanks for sharing. Thank you and hello everybody. Um, I'm very glad that we had the poll so I know not to say good afternoon. Um, I'm so delighted to be talking to you today about two areas that are very important to me and, and I hope to you as well. The one is the uncertain future and the mysterious future perhaps of healthcare, where it's going, what's happening there. And then something else that's really, really important to me is preparing for the leadership and management in health. So it's my pleasure to be with you today. Fantastic, Louise. So I might let you get started then and share all this wonderful research that you've prepared for the session today. Thanks, Amelia. So um, I'm hoping in the time that we're together we'll be able to talk about leadership in health and how that might be a little bit different from management, having a look at the changing nature of healthcare worldwide but mostly in Australia, considering the challenges and perhaps the policy drivers for that change, having a look at professional capabilities and considering what the impact of technology might be on the leadership and management roles of the future. And basically what we're looking at is how do we prepare for an unknown future? So um, particularly in health, leadership is recognized for its complexity and its purposes. Leadership has been studied for many, many years and there are very many theories about them and they keep being modernized. And so, you know, it's good that we acknowledge the complexity. It also has various purposes in different times, but basically health leaders strive to improve the clinical and quality of life indicators. And in doing so, the well-being of the entire health system, they're all part of it. And good leadership, all leadership, but good leadership affects people positively. It adds to their satisfaction. It secures the trust in the management. Um, it gets commitment and it looks to both individual and team effectiveness. And of course, as you would imagine, it has an impact on the culture and the climate of the organization. Importantly, it plays a pivotal role in drawing people towards a central goal. Um, this explanation came from Health Workforce Australia. They have been disestablished, but they did leave us a wealth of wonderful research um, for which we're very grateful. So when do we have a look at what the actions are for leadership in health? We realize that that action is very much relational. There's an emphasis on building shared understandings with the purpose of enabling change and dealing with challenging issues. And that came from the Hetty Health Leadership Framework that was um, written up in 2013. So the actions for management focuses on explicit and relatively concrete phenomena such as structures and processes and measures and it's on task related action at particular points in time and it's also based on relevant authority. Once again from the Hetty Health Leadership Framework and as you can imagine there's a certain amount of management in leadership and a certain amount of leadership in management. So when we have a look at what we're thinking of as the changing nature of healthcare, we realize that there's a strong emphasis now on the importance of health literacy and a greater focus on prevention of ill health. There's a move from acute care 
into the primary healthcare arena, a move from hospital-based care to considering how we care for people in the community. There's been a great demand for an integrated team-based care approach. And of course, the impact of technology, such as artificial intelligence and e-health and telehealth, has also had an impact. In many ways, it's been an enabler. In some ways, it's meant that we need to use critical reasoning a lot more strongly than we did before. And of course, in all of this, you really need to be thinking about how you build a portfolio of transferable skills. So we'll talk a little bit about the portability of skills between the various roles in healthcare and the importance of perhaps being a generalist specialist rather than having a very narrow focus in a particular discipline without considering other areas of health. So our challenges, as probably won't come as a surprise to you, is the change in demographics where we seem to have an ageing population. We're also happy to hear that there's you know, improvements in longevity, but that has brought with it age-related diseases and you would know that there's been a lot of discussion in recent times about dementia, the growing number in dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So although, as the policy says, we're living longer, we also want to live better. There's a greater emphasis now on people wishing to age in place, which is a wonderful idea because they wish to be in community, they wish to be not isolated from their age group necessarily, but they wish to be more integrated in their communities. And that, of course, will call for different ways of managing their health needs, different forms of leadership and certainly different management. There's also changes to the way all of this is being funded and I'm sure that you're aware of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the NDIS. This will have an impact as well on how many of the um, services are being funded and that may change to some way the nature in which they are being allocated, the way they're being accessed and the way they're being managed. We're talking more about a hospital in the home and thinking here as well about palliative care. And I'm sure you're aware that there's been a rise in chronic diseases. I'm mentoring several here, arthritis, asthma, back pain, the various cancers, cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, and even the mental health conditions. So what are the major policy initiatives that are driving demand for new service delivery models? Well, there's more and more talk about an integrated, joined up approach to care. There's greater emphasis now, not only on the patient or the client, but on the whole family. It's calling for an interprofessional team-based delivery. And we're looking at innovative uses of both new and older technology. We're looking at collaboration across both the private and the public sectors and we're looking at the commissioning of services. So again you'll see that this is going to call for um, management and leadership in slightly different areas. It's going to open it up, it's going to offer more opportunities but it's going to bring its own challenges. So when we think about what makes for successful leadership, we tend to think about the capabilities and we think of them in three different categories. Very important and important for leadership are the personal capabilities, your own abilities to be aware of yourself and how you interact, the self-awareness, self-regulation, being able to deal with difficult situations and be in control of yourself, decisiveness and commitment. We talk about those interpersonal capabilities, your ability to influence groups of people, to get them to understand what your ideas are in an area and when you think that something's important, help them understand why you think it's important. And also very, very important, your abilities and your cap capabilities to empathize. And not to forget the cognitive ones, your abilities and capabilities to diagnose, to have different strategies and importantly, to be flexible and to be able to be responsive when cha things change in your situation or in the situation you are either leading or managing.
some lovely research done by Professor Jeff Scott has actually ranked these capabilities for success. And I don't think you'll be surprised to know that right on top is being able to organize your work and manage your time effectively. And dare I say, Amelia, this is very important if you're trying to do work and study, as I know some of you are probably hoping to do or are already doing. It's very important to be wanting to produce as good a job as possible. And please note this as good a job as possible. We're not looking for perfection, we're just looking for your very best effort. The ability to be able to set and justify priorities, very important. And this one, being able to remain calm under pressure or when things go wrong. What do they say about judging people about how well they are able to untangle the Christmas lights? Being able to face and learn from errors and being able to listen openly to feedback. So. That's where some of that self-management comes in, being able not to be defensive if you get feedback, being able to make the most of that feedback so that it's useful to you. Also really important, and I'm surprised that it's at number six only, is being able to identify the core issues from a massive detail in any situation. Indeed, you will be aware that we do sometimes have to make decisions about all the information coming our way and figure out what really matters and what is core. So you will have seen that there are initials behind these various statements and they relate to the code. So we're talking about some of the general skills and knowledge. We're then talking about the three capabilities I mentioned, personal, interpersonal and cognitive. Okay, let's see what the other six look like. Being able to work with staff, senior staff, without being intimidated being willing to take on responsibility for projects and importantly, how they turn out. Being able to develop and contribute positively to team-based projects. Team-based work and team-based university work and team-based anything comes with a really large set of challenges. Not many people like doing teamwork. Many people realize after they've completed something team-based how much they've learned from each other and about themselves. So really important there and important as we go forward and important when you think about your roles as a leader or a manager. There's an absolute importance in having a willingness to persevere when things are not working out as anticipated. So sometimes you just need to have a fallback plan, you need to have a plan B and you need to be able to let go when things don't work out exactly the way you planned them. Very important to be able to empathize and, and work productively with people from a wide range of backgrounds. That's what's going to be more and more in the future. And as you know, we have great diversity already in Australia. But if you start thinking about working in communities and working with different people and working with NGOs and working with um, colleagues from different areas, you realize how you're going to need to be able to understand their points of view so that you can work productively with them. And importantly, being able to develop and use a network of colleagues to help you solve some of the key workplace problems that you may encounter. So characteristics for success in health leadership. Well, we do expect you to have a foundation in the health sciences. And we saw very pleasingly today that there were a large number of you from nursing and midwifery, from allied health, from health in general, from education and curious about the other. But you've obviously got an interest in health and it's good to have a foundation in health as well. As I said before, experience of but also the willingness to work with other disciplines. Discipline, disciplines seem to be a little like cultures and sometimes they have their own language and sometimes it takes a little bit of extra effort to understand what they mean. But mostly you find that you really do have the same values at heart. When you're working with clients or patients, you really have the patient's well-being at heart, regardless of your discipline. Very important is to understand the role of research and evidence-based practice. What do you do with that? And that's where your critical thinking comes in and your critical reasoning. The ability to th synthesize information and to extrapolate ideas. And as we said before, very often to synthesize information from an overwhelming amount that might be coming your way. 
openness to ideas and eagerness for lifelong learning. One of the things that we learn, and it's one of our, our graduate attributes at Southern Cross, is that you really need to prepare for lifelong learning. If you think back 20 years, to 10 years, or even five years, you'll realize in so many ways that some of the things you're doing today, you're doing differently to what you did before. And the degree to which you're able to adapt and you're eager for lifelong learning, to that degree, you're successful there. Importantly is this idea of being self-motivated, especially with leadership. You're needing to lead from the front. You're needing to lead as an example. You need to be self-motivated, even on some of those days when it feels hard to motivate yourself. You need to be self-aware of the ways in which your actions impact on others, of things you say to them, and how you behave around them. And you need to be self-regulated, especially in those situations where things don't work out quite the way you want it. And allied with this is the idea of resilience. And here I like to think of us working towards mastery rather than performance. And the research tells us that people who are into gaming are much better at this than those of us who play the old games. So let's think for a moment about one of the older games, like chess. Clearly a winner and a loser. Let's think about mastery in the games you might play online. You get to a point and it's game over. And what do you do? Mostly people go back on again and try to improve their own score, working towards mastery. Useful there and also useful in many of the things, especially when you start tackling something new for the first time in your life. When you go back to study after a long time, when you start looking at something that you haven't looked at before, it's being able to think, okay, this is how much I know now. Oh, I know more than I knew yesterday. I'm working towards it. Importantly, the ability to give and also receive constructive feedback. So constructive feedback, the kind of feedback that helps people make changes and positive changes. And in all of this, you'll see the importance of being collaborative and adaptable. Those are our characteristics for success in health leadership, but probably in many other areas as well. So when we talk about preparing for an unknown future, what are the elements? What do we think about? Well, we probably know that healthcare is the largest industry in Australia. It's growing and it is also changing. And we are preparing in many ways for an unknown future. Those of you who are already in the workplace and those of us who are trying to help people prepare for the sorts of careers and clusters of careers there will be in the future. We're all living longer but we also want to live better. And this is a challenge for the health industry. It's a challenge in planning for, in responding to, and effectively managing that change in a complex and also busy environment. You can't stop things happening. Um, they have a, a, a timeline of their own. So being able to manage that change in that busy environment is very, very important. So basically, we're all going to have to be more innovative, more flexible, and we are going to need leadership. We're going to need those people who are open to opportunity, the people who can look at data, look at systems, be critical about them, and make decisions about them, and lead others. We talk a little bit about technology, and I don't know how many of you are aware of IBM's Watson. So if you think about IDM and you think about instances like Wikipedia and Google, and you know how much we rely on Google these days, well, think of artificial intelligence in the shape of Watson, and now Watson Health, who has, at a click, all of that information. How can we use that to best affect those of us who are health professionals? What role will that play for us, and how can we harness it? We know that we are collecting huge amounts of data, so the big data mining is becoming more and more important. And research shows that there are deep mind apps, and these are being designed specifically for healthcare professionals. Some of these apps are being used to alert them to emergencies or to look at data and alert them to risks. They estimate that the use of artificial intelligence in health 
will increase tenfold in the next five years. Something to keep in mind and something to be aware of. You probably already know about e-health and you're probably also aware of the ways in which we're able to use telehealth. One of the ways that it's being used very successfully is in aged care facilities where they're able to go into telehealth, get some help there, rather than putting the poor older person into an ambulance and taking them to an already overloaded A&I um, department. So telehealth is probably going to grow, but it's going to be important for us to inform how we want that to grow and how we will use that. When they talk about the future of work, the Foundation for Australia New Work Order in their report for 2016 proposed that there are three global economic forces. These are automation, globalisation and collaboration. And we've already mentioned some of these. The wisdom that comes out of the report, what I've gathered, is that you really need a set of transferable enterprise skills. There's going to be demand for digital skills, there's going to be demand for critical thinking. There's going to be demand for creativity. In other words, ways of synthesizing what you know and using it in different transformational ways. And also, there's going to be a need for presentation skills. So you can see I'm already practicing today. There's going to be a shift, basically, from a focus on a job, the idea of a job for life, to skills and to how those skills might be arranged in a job cluster. So the idea is that you choose a job cluster and then work on developing those skills that support that job cluster. They predict that it's likely that you will make at least 17 changes in, employer, in employers over your work career and that this could possibly be across five different types of careers. They talk of seven new job clusters in, in Australia in particular. And so I've listed them here with some idea of what they might look like. And the ones that I'm particularly interested in are the ones where I put them in bold. So starting with the idea of a generator cluster. And that's going to require a higher level of interpersonal interaction. A coordinator cluster. Those are for people who work in administrative and behind the scenes processes. The artisan cluster, well, there's always going to be a need for some manual tasks, no matter how much automation we get. And these might be related to construction, production, maintenance, or even technical customer services. There's going to be a need for a design cluster. And those are skills and knowledge of science, and mathematics, and design. And you can see how those might absolutely generate new ideas in terms of the environments that we might wish to design in healthcare. Certainly a, techno a technologist cluster, so understanding and manipulation of digital technology. A carer cluster, I'm pleased to announce, and they would be seeking to improve both the mental or physical or the well-being in general of others. And this includes, of course, our medical care and personal care. And then there's the informer cluster. Those are the ones who provide information, education or business services. The ones with the strongest future prospects are the ones that I highlighted before and bolded. And now we're going to have a look at the skills that are most in demand for those three clusters. The carers, they're going to need interaction skills. They need problem solving and organizational skills. They're going to need to know how to work successfully in teams. They're going to need how to use research, how to find it how to assess it, how to imply, implement it. They're going to need a lot to know a lot about planning and, of course, time management. The informers, interestingly enough, are also going to need interaction skills and problem-solving skills. And they're going to need detail organizational and orientation skills. They can't do that without good communication skills. They're also going to have to know and have digital literacy and no research. Appreciate research. 
The technologists, interestingly, also need interaction skills and those detail orientation skills because they're going to be involved a lot in the planning and the quality assurance and the project management. And you can see how this is going to speak to your leadership skills that you need and to the management skills that you need. I thought it was interesting to see how often these inter interact and overlap even in three different clusters. So the main messages that I would like to leave with you today is that you need to think of the sets of skills that you might need. I'd like you to start by thinking of the sets of skills that you already have. Many people say to me, but I don't know anything about that or I haven't done anything of that. And actually when you sit down about it and you have a look at what those skills are, very often you have at least something that leads towards it. I want you to think in terms of flexibility adaptability and transferability. What do you do? How flexible are you about how you do it? Can you use that somewhere else? And can you transfer that? You need to develop those three capabilities we spoke about. The personal one, the interpersonal one, and the cognitive ones. And think about the job clusters and think about where you could use your own skills and talents. And importantly, which ones you might identify for development, which ones you might start working on. Above all, be open to opportunity. Consider change in a positive light and hang on to lifelong learning. And in terms of leadership, be the leader that you would like to work for. Thanks so much, Louise. That's been immensely interesting and valuable and you know, even as a marketing professional, I can see the transferable skills and the changing nature of everyone's workplace and the impact of technology and an aging population and the fact that we may well have up to five careers in our lifetime. Uh, when you think about some of the research and um, some of the sort of things that are trending at the moment in topics like the 70-year career, it's, I can see the implication not only for healthcare but for everyone to really be constantly learning and picking up those skills. Um, so interesting about interpersonal skills being relevant to all those job clusters and just being that you know flexible, adaptable learner that's ready to jump into their you know fourth, fifth career in their lifetime. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, now as people have kind of gone through, if you do have a question for Dr. Louise Horsmanshoff, please pop it in the in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. We'd love to hear from you. If you're sitting there thinking, how do I continue to learn from Dr. Louise Horsmanshoff and you know, this has really sparked an interest in me and I'm thinking, how do I get to be more of a foundation of healthcare leadership and learn and prepare myself for the future of healthcare? Um, we do have two online degrees that I'm going to talk to you about today that are uh, relevant for healthcare professionals and people interested in healthcare. So they are the Master of Healthcare Leadership and we also do the Master of Business Administration with the Health Services Management Specialisation. So I'll go through a little bit about each of those because it could be a great opportunity to continue learning with us. So in both instances, both of those degrees are 100% online. So wherever you're based, um, you'll be able to access our learning environment, you'll be able to network with your peers who are also studying the same degree. Um, there's no limitation anymore, it doesn't matter if you're based in Outback Australia or on the other side of the world or in downtown Brisbane, you'll be able to study with SCU online. And we are um, compatible with any device. So we have students that log on through their iPad or even their iPhone most of the time or an Android device. And then perhaps you do your assignments on a computer but you've got access to that learning environment all day, every day. We do have an interactive element in our learning environment. So you can network with your peers and you can make comments and um, really understand what other perspectives there are on that particular topic or how are people going with the assignment. You don't necessarily have to find time the same time every week. You can jump in and out and make comments and discuss the content with your peers and with your facilitator and then um, jump back in when you've got some time after work or at your lunch break or on the way to work um, and see what the chat has kind of got to throughout the day. 
Throughout the online learning experience, you'll also have a dedicated student success advisor. So that's in addition to the academic support through the course coordinator and the facilitator. The student success advisor provides non-academic support. So they're your go-to person for things like how to access the learning environment or how to get access to Blackboard or I'm really nervous because I haven't been at university in 10 or 20 years or perhaps I was a hospital trained nurse and I've never really set foot in a university and you know I don't know about referencing and I need some of those kind of basic university skills, the student success advisor will reach out to you on a regular basis and really be your non-academic support person for the life of the degree. So that's a huge um, benefit to studying online and it sort of takes away that potential to be isolated or feel like you don't know where to get help. With our online uh, degrees, we do offer six study periods a year. So it's an accelerated part-time model. So you take one unit at a time and you'll take six in a calendar year. If you've got a holiday or some busy time at work, you can take one study period off and come back in the next one or what happens to suit your schedule. But we used to think of you know, starting things in February and July and now we can start the degree six times a year and get it done really fast because we're doing six units in a calendar year. In terms of um, fee help and uh, financing the degree, you pay for each study period as they come about. So you're not paying up front for the whole degree, you're paying as you go. And if you do need fee help through um, the tax system, um, that's available to el eligible students. So it can be a good way to finance the degree. So just a little bit specifically about each of the degrees. So the Master of Healthcare Leadership, which Dr. Louise Horsmanshoff is the course coordinator for, it's really designed for that interdisciplinary healthcare leadership perspective. So thinking about all of the best practices in healthcare leadership and learning alongside nurses and midwives and allied health professionals and um, some medical professionals and even uh, vets from time to time. We've had vets apply and enroll in the degree. So um, really that broad interdisciplinary approach and thinking about how do I sort of manage an interdisciplinary team for the best outcome for the patient, um, which this will be the degree for you if you're interested in that. It is a two-year degree in that part-time accelerated model and you've got 12 units to complete. So the units are up there on the screen at the moment. I do have the brochures available for downloading the handout button on the GoToWebinar panel as well. So feel free to go and grab that if you're interested. There's a lot more detail about the units on our website and the enrolment advisors will be more than happy to talk to you about what you'll learn in the Master of Healthcare Leadership. Alternatively, if you're thinking about um, getting more of a broad management degree and thinking, you know, I really want to learn some of those business skills like funding and finance and accounting and leading and managing people and even marketing project management. The Master of Business Administration is a generalist management degree, but we do offer a specialisation in health services management. So the units are up there on the screen and there's more detail again on our website and in the brochure that's available through the handout tab on the right hand side of your screen. Um, but it's that broad uh, business master's degree. Um, it is about two years to two and a half years part time. It does depend on your work experience and previous education um, as to how many units you'll have to complete, but it's 16 units in total and some students are eligible for advanced standing, which might bring you down to around two years part time. Again, in that online accelerated model. Um, and one other last thing just to mention before we jump into all the questions. Um, we're really keen to work with you. If you've got uh, colleagues or a team in your hospital or healthcare setting that are interested in education or postgrad study or even getting some CPD hours by working with us or running a webinar just like this one, just for your team, we'd be more than happy to work with you to implement that. We work with a number of hospitals around Australia at the moment to promote postgraduate study. It's been really effective. We've got a number of students who um, study from the same hospital, so they'll meet up on a regular day if people want to kind of get together on site and talk about the assignment and, and kind of that optional extra support. So really great to be studying with a colleague and we'd be more than happy to talk about how we can facilitate that and help your healthcare organisation. So if you're interested in something like that, please contact us directly. Our details are up there on the screen and they will be again on the next slide as well. 
Great. So now is the fun part where you get to ask us what um, what we think about some particular topic or is there something you wanted more detail on or even just a comment or um, an idea. We'd love to hear from you. So keep those questions flowing through in the uh, question tab on the right hand side. Um, so one of the questions is what is the difference between the Master of Health leader, Healthcare Leadership and the Master of Health Services Management? So I think the question there is what's the difference between the Master of Healthcare Leadership and the MBA with the Health Services Specialisation? There's a handout actually available for download in that handouts tab on the right which does actually go through the difference and help um, kind of distinguish which one might be more suitable for you. So I'd suggest that if you're thinking that you're not sure which one of those degrees is most suitable, that handout will kind of walk you through the difference. There is a bit of a difference in terms of entry requirements. Um, so for the Master of Healthcare Leadership, you do need to have a healthcare degree and be registered as a healthcare professional with at least one year of experience in a healthcare setting, whereas MBA is a little bit more broad. So you can um, either have a bachelor's degree in any discipline or a number of years of work experience in a management position without a bachelor and be eligible for MBA. So download the handout for that one and then um, the other thing you can do is speak to our enrolment advisors. So the best way to reach them is on our phone number there, 1300 589 882 and just let them know what it is that your particular career and education goal is and they'll talk to you about the difference and which one might be more suitable. Great question. Um, the next question is, is it possible to list the jobs that these courses could lead us to? We do have some detail on that on our website, but given that we've got you on the line, Dr. Louise Horsmanshoff, did you have some um, suggestions as to the jobs that you might kind of get to with the Master of Healthcare Leadership? Thank you, Amelia. It's always an interesting question and considering that we're really working for an unknown future, there's probably going to be several that I won't even mention. But these are the growing areas that we're looking at <laughs> now. And, um, uh, most people come from a situation where they've already worked for some time in leadership or management roles. So they've got some experience, but they haven't ever got the position and they haven't ever got the pay or the title that goes with it because they haven't had the credential, basically. And so getting that opens up some of those doors. So it can be more than a team leader. There are many um, new positions that are opening up in the areas like in the aged care facilities where they are managing bigger and more diverse areas where they both have residential and perhaps they have community. Um, they might have um, care for the home, all sorts of things. So a lot of those are opening up. Basically anywhere where you can imagine that you have leadership and where your skills will lead you and where you have an interest, you can be sure that there are going to be issues that need to be managed and where leadership is called for. And so to some degree, I think part of the excitement is, Amelia, that you're almost going to be structuring some of those um, positions or job clusters for yourself. Um, and very often it's things that you hear about. You know, we're all very socially connected now. And in social media, you'll find that someone might talk about something. And when you think about the skills that you've got there, you might realize that you actually have them. As Amelia said, we've been delighted to have people who've been doing, um, who were vets, who decided that there was obviously something for leadership. Sometimes it's somebody who's been actually tapped on the shoulder, saying, really, this is part of our succession planning. We would like you to step up, but you actually do need to have some more qualifications so that, you know, it's, it's as transparent as anything while we're employing you. I'm not sure I've answered all the questions, but as I said, some of them might be quite unknown at this stage. Yeah, definitely, Louise. And I think there's that element of, you know, doing something like a Master of Healthcare Leadership to learn those transferable leadership skills for jobs that might not yet have been even created. And then there's that element of, we see quite often um, students come through who get to a point in their career where they do need that additional framework that a master's degree provides and in order to really step up into a management role or their next management role above that, 
they're really, they need that framework that's provided through a master's degree. So it's sort of like for the job that you can get today and also the job that doesn't even exist yet but you're thinking, you know, in 10 or 20 years might be where you want to go. So really great kind of to get those transferable leadership skills out of the degree for both options. We might just have one, one more question before we wrap up. So do you currently have to be in a management position to complete the degree? So you don't. Did you want to talk about that, Louise? Um, thank you, Amelia. Yes. Um, <clears throat> because of the way we work with our assessments, we try to make them relevant to the real world. So we understand that there is going to be content, and changes in content, and, and that might grow. But what we try to work with is directing the assessment so that you're applying those theories and those changes and those principles to situations in your own workplace. And so that's what, what makes it so, so um, I guess, flexible but also interesting. And if you've never had any experience there, so if you're fresh out of your bachelor's degree and you haven't even worked in it, it's going to be very difficult for you to think about how you might be leading change in management when you've had no experience there. However, when you've worked for a year or two, you might actually have some suggestions yourself in ways you would like things to change. And when you have those suggestions along with what the theories are and the work that you're doing, it gives you greater direction. And also, Amelia, as you work with your colleagues and peers in this environment, you are being privy to a whole range of interprofessional ideas about different changes in management, different things that might happen that are coming out of the discussion boards and chat sessions. And so that helps as well, but it's good to have a foundation so that you know what to deal with and what you're building on. Yes, absolutely, Louise. So you don't have to be a manager, but it's best if you've got work experience for both degrees in order to come in and be able to apply that in your workplace. So you don't have to be managing people, but professional work experience is required. And Great. Amelia, sorry, there's also many situations where it may not look as if it's a formal management or a formal leadership role. But you have been asked to be team leader on something or take the lead on something yep. or to, you know, deliver something. And so when you go back to thinking about the skills that you use there and you think about the skills we've talked about today, you realise that you probably are beginning to build towards that anyway. So that's one of the ways to think about it. And I guess think about where you would like to go, the things that are interesting to you, the, the questions in health that you would like to help solve. Yep, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, we haven't gone through quite all of the questions, so those people that we didn't get to your question, we will follow up with you directly. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone for sparing 45 minutes of their day to learn from Dr. Louise Horsmanshop. And I wanted to thank you, especially Louise, for sharing all of your insight and research and, you know, giving us a kind of preview into what the future might hold for healthcare. So thank you very much. Thank you so much and I look forward to welcoming at least some of you um, to studying with us in Southern Cross. Great. Have a good day everybody. Thank you. Thank you.